Well, good evening, everyone. Good to see you. Good to be with you. I've been looking forward to being with you and been praying that the Lord will prosper what we do together. You have an outline right there. I'm going to try to stick fairly close to the outline. It's a relatively simple outline, so I hope we'll be able to, to follow it. I hope you have a Bible, and if you do, I'd like to ask you to open up to Romans chapter 8. Uh, we're going to read just three verses. You know, Romans 8 is considered one of the, if not the greatest chapters in the Bible, certainly one of the greatest chapters in the Bible. And it does something that I am convinced that Christians desperately need. It, it, it encourages us. I, I'm, as I've gotten older, as I've ministered to people for a long period of time, a conviction, it's like the sun rising, comes out, and you barely see the light, and then it becomes noonday. That's the conviction I have about the people of God needing encouragement. I'm not sure there's anything that we need in order to live for the Lord Jesus Christ at any time, but particularly in the time we're called to live and to be faithful to Him. I don't think there's anything we need more than encouragement. I just think we need to be encouraged, and I don't know anything that will give us encouragement like the grace of God in Jesus Christ. So look with me at Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 30, that little pretty much almost right in the middle, not exactly the middle, but I think it's what everything goes to and what everything, uh, everything flows out of it. Uh, this is the New American Standard Version. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to become conformed to the image of His Son, so that He would be the firstborn among many brethren. And those whom He predestined, He also called. And those whom He called, He also justified. And those whom He justified, He also glorified. Let me pray one more time. Father, I can't do anything. I, I won't be of any value to my brothers and sisters unless you come and you make it valuable. But we praise you tonight, beginning with me, that the treasure is in earthen vessels so that when the treasure is seen, experienced, and rejoiced in, the, the giver is the one who gets the glory, and you're the giver. So send your spirit now upon us and speak through me and give us encouragement as we begin exploring the riches that are found in this text. It's a mother load of gold. Help us to dig some of it out in the next few weeks, we ask. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm not sure what, how to describe what I'm actually doing right here. I don't know if it falls into the category of a sermon or if it falls into the category of a lecture or if it falls into the category of a talk. So I'm going to tell you up front, I, I'm like a preacher who once asked a friend of his, have you ever heard me preach? And he looked at the preacher and he said, I've never heard you do anything else. <laughs> so this may well sound like a sermon. And if it does, I, I just remind you I'm a preacher. And as a preacher, I'm very much like a, an artist whose specialty was lions. And they came and they asked him if he would paint an angel for them. And he said, well, you know, I paint lions. I don't paint angels. And they said, no, that's OK. You're such a great artist. We, we trust you. So he painted the angel, ended up like a lion. And the artist said, I tell you, I was a lion painter, not an angel painter. I'm a, I'm a preacher. So this comes across as a sermon. We won't take a, we don't take a collection, I think, do we? So we won't take a collection. We won't, we won't sing a, a closing hymn. I had the privilege in seminary of studying under a man whom I consider to be the finest teacher of preaching in the United States at the time I was at Reformed Theological Seminary. He was a man named Richard Allen Bodie. He was a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's court. You can imagine how somebody from, from the East, the Far East, functioned at, at Reformed Theological Seminary in Jackson, Mississippi in the late 60s and the early, early 70s. Needless to say, he, he, he had a, a difficult time. He gave as good as he got. Uh, one of the benefits of Mr. Bodie to me and to my brothers who had the privilege of studying under him was this. Mr. Bodie told us, you are never ready to preach a sermon until you can put the entire sermon, the entire talk, the entire speech, everything that you're trying to say into a single sentence. And until you have that single sentence and it's shining like the North Star, you are not ready to stand and talk to people. I, I am so grateful 
for that emphasis. He called it a proposition. And since I was 21 years old, long ago in a galaxy far, far away, I have thought propositionally, I have written propositionally, and I have learned to speak propositionally. So I want to give you the proposition of what I hope we will do in this particular study and the times that we have together. It, it's, it's right there under the word theme that God wants you to live as a grace-focused optimist by believing that Romans 8, 28 through 30 is talking about you. So if you get that, if that sinks in, if by the grace of God, the roots of that truth go deep into the soil of your life and you water it with prayer and water it with meditation and supremely water it with simple childlike trust that Romans 8, 28 through 30 talks about you, it'll revolutionize your life. And it will help you to begin living the way I am convinced that every child of God, every man who follows Jesus Christ, every woman who belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ ought to live. And that is as a grace-focused optimist. Now, that's not standard language that you normally hear in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so what I want to do tonight by way of introduction is I just want to take that phrase, grace-focused optimist, and break it down and give you some idea of what I am talking about. And then when we get to the end, if you don't like it and you want to throw stones, I, 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 will, I will gladly be stoned, okay? So grace-focused optimism. God wants us, God wants each of his children to live as a grace-focused optimist by believing that Romans 8, 28 through 30 is talking about you. So I will have succeeded if at the end of our time together, I will praise God for that success, if at the end of that, our time together, that you begin living and moving and having your being as a follower of Jesus who is characterized by grace-focused optimism. Uh, it's the most encouraging truth I have ever run across. Lord willing, in a week or two down the road, I want to share with you how I came to this truth. I came to it through the worst time I have ever gone through as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, a very difficult time for me serving in a particular church. I was knocked flat on my back, uh, was, went to a two-week depression, couldn't get out of it, was greatly disturbed because here I was a Christian, and I think Christians ought to be able to handle these things, and not only that, I was a Christian minister. And so I had two strikes against me and began trying to figure out what was wrong and by the grace of God, the spirit of the living God led me to what I call grace-focused optimism. So it's something dear to my heart. I hope it becomes dear, dear to your heart. So let's break it down. God wants you to live as a grace-focused optimism. So let's start. The first word right there you see is the word optimism. Now look, I, I am very, very aware of the fact that optimism is not the typical synonym that people use when they think of Christianity. If you were doing a crossword puzzle and 15 down said an eight word synonym for biblical Christianity, O-P-T-I-M-I-S-M -I -I is probably not what you would put in the blanks. <laughs> because most of us do not think about optimism as a Christian trait, as a Christian characteristic. And yet I want to argue from the Bible that optimism is the biblical attitude. Indeed, I'm willing to argue, and I'm going to try to prove that to you and show that to you in the course of our time together, that optimism is the grace perspective, that if we are looking at life from a biblical point of view, if we're looking at life from the perspective of grace, then we're going to be people who are optimistic. Optimistic. Now, that's very different sounding, is it not? It's quite unusual. And I think we need to pause and get in our minds what is meant by this word optimism. And I think the best way to do that is this, to break it down. And first of all, to let you grasp and hear what is not meant by optimism so we can get that out of the way and then come back and take a look at what is meant by optimism because I am convinced that Romans 8, 28 through 30 is, is the most optimistic text you're ever going to run across. I think it's the most optimistic statement that has ever been made. So let's come back. Let's take this word optimism. What is not meant by optimism? When I say to you that I believe God wants us to be grace-focused optimists, 
What do I mean by that word optimism? Well, here's what I do not mean. Please listen very carefully. The optimism that I believe God wants us to have is not something temperamental. My dearest friend in life was a guy named Lindsey Crosby, and Lindsey quite suddenly, about two and a half years ago, was taken by God to glory. Lindsey was temperamentally an optimist. Lindsey always got up on the right side of the bed. Lindsey was the kind of guy who, when he looked at the glass, it, it was half full, man. I mean, it could have that much in it. It could be a 10-ounce glass, but Lindsey would look at it and say, well, yeah, man, that thing, that that's glass is full. You know, we, we, we can use it right there. Some of us are not congenital optimists the way Lindsey was. Some of us, like moi, for example, come from the womb making Charlie Brown look like the most optimistic person you're ever going to meet on the face of the earth. Some of us look at the glass and we don't simply not see the glass as half full. We don't even see it as half empty. We don't even see the glass. <laughs> there are temperamental optimists, people who are optimists, got nothing to do with the truth of God, got nothing to do with the grace of God other than natural grace, or the grace that God gives us in a variety of ways, but it's not saving grace. I'm not talking about that. This is not the kind of optimism that you can have only if you are of a certain temperament. You, you can have this optimism regardless of what your temperament is. Indeed, I believe the Bible teaches quite clearly that you ought to have it regardless of what your temperament is. I agree wholeheartedly with David Martin Lloyd-Jones who describes the Apostle Paul as a naturally pessimistic man who was made an optimist by the grace of God. So we're not talking about temperamental Optimism. So when we get to the end of this, you can't say, well, you know, that's just Charlie. He's a, a natural native optimist. I'm not. I'm not. So it's not temperamental. Then the second thing it is not is this. I'm not talking about circumstantial optimism. There was a British politician who was described like this. He was at his best when life was at its best. You know anybody like that? <laughs> You're looking at, at one right here. I, 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 when I'm walking in the sunshine in what the deep south calls tall cotton, you're not going to meet anybody more optimistic than I. But this optimism, grace-focused optimism, isn't dependent upon our circumstances. You don't need the sun to be shining on you to be optimistic in the way of grace-focused optimism. It is an optimism that can live in the bitterest winter that life can send into your existence. It's an optimism like the old salamander, uh, uh, from what I can understand about that creature, he wasn't like the salamanders you and I know, you know, the little lizards. Uh, the salamander, whatever that creature was, it was said that he could live in the fire. Well, the optimism that we're talking about with grace-focused optimism, it, it can live in anything. It can live in good times and it can live in bad times. It can say what the Apostle Paul says about contentment. I know how to be optimistic when I am abounding and I know how to be optimistic when I am a base. So it's got nothing Nothing to do with our circumstances. And then the third thing that we want to look at and consider from the point of view of what this optimism is not is this. It's not temperamental, it's not circumstantial, and it is not nonsensical. It is not like a Dr. Seuss nursery rhyme. So many people who are optimistic, have an optimism that it, it's sheer nonsense. It's an optimism that comes from sticking your head in the sand. It's an optimism that comes from not looking at life realistically. This optimism, grace-focused optimism, is an optimism that looks at the East of Eden existence, the time and place you and I are called upon to live, with all of its sin, with all of its sorrow, with all of its suffering, and it remains optimistic even in the face of these things. It's very much like Abraham. Don't you love the description of Abraham that you find in Romans 4? I, I'm a King James guy. I'm tell you right now, I, I use the New American Standard because I can't get anybody to listen to the King James. I can't even get my wife to listen to the King. I got a real shot at getting you guys to listen to me. I just confess my impotence right there. 
I love the King James, and I, I love it for a very simple reason. It was good enough for the Apostle Paul. It's, it's, frankly, it's good enough for me. I mean, I, you know, if Paul liked it, I'm, 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 I'm cool with it. But the King James, I think, is wrong in what it says about Abraham in Romans chapter 4 when it talks about Abraham's faith. It, because the King James basically says that Abraham did not look at the obstacles, the obstacles that confronted him and Sarah. Uh, Abraham was 100, Sarah uh, was 90. They were beyond, naturally speaking, childbearing capability. And yet Abraham, he goes ahead and he builds a, a, a little children's room. He puts his LSU stuff. This is my illustration. Y'all do what you want with it. He puts his LSU stuff up there and you know, getting ready for the baby. But what does he do in order to do that? Well, I think the right texts say about him that he looked at himself and he looked at Sarah's impotence. He faced the difficulties and yet they did not daunt him. He remained optimistic in the face of the obstacles. Now, that's the optimism we're talking about right here. It is the ability to see the hardest things in life. The ability to face and handle the hardest things in life. And to face and handle these things remaining optimistic. I, I'm going to bear testimony to this. I had not planned this a, 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 as I've thought through. I've lost two grandchildren. I have eight grandchildren. I've got six on the face of this earth. I've got two in heaven. I was asked to do the memorial service for one of them. It's the hardest thing I have ever been asked to do as a man. And I can stand before you and tell you that what brought me through, what sustained me, what enabled me and my wife was grace-focused optimism. Did I hurt? Yes. Did I grieve? Yes. But I did not, by the grace of God, grieve as those who have no hope. Why? Because of grace-focused optimism. It is not naivete. It is not a denial of the harsh facts of life. It faces them, and yet it does not pull down its flag. It does not surrender. So, not nonsensical. Not, as you see there, temperamental. Not circumstantial. Not nonsensical. And then the fourth, it's not emotional. You say, now, what... What in the world are you talking about there? I mean by that quite simply this. It is not primarily a feeling. You get around some optimistic people and they're like a Mexican jumping bean. You know, you know I mean, some of you don't even know what a Mexican jumping bean is, you too. But they're little beans and they bounce around in your hand like that. And there's some optimistic people, you, you get around them and it just, they're like a, an electrical fence. They say, mm, you know, they've just got this vibrancy about them. And so you get the feeling that the, the optimism they have is a feeling. But grace-focused optimism is, is not a matter of emotion. Follow me now. It is more a matter of your thinking, more a matter of your choosing, more a matter of believing in spite of how you feel. Grace-focused optimism is an optimism like a godly wife who is able by grace to put aside her feelings and live with a very ungodly husband. It can handle feelings that are not as desirable as one might wish. So are you with me there? Are we tracking together? Have I at least communicated to you what I'm not talking about, hopefully to clear away any misconceptions? All right, then what are we talking about? What is this matter of grace-focused optimism? Well, again, I, I, I've tried to sketch it out for you, and I, I think there, there are six things we'll just touch on. First of all, grace-focused optimism is theological. And what I mean by that, as much as anything, is the old meaning of theological. God-centered and god Oriented. I, I don't know if you know much about Dale Ralph Davis. Uh, I had the privilege of studying with Dr. Davis when I was doing doctrinal work. He's, he's arguably the best known Old Testament scholar, evangelical at least, in, in our day. And, and Dr. Davis emphasizes one point. He says, when you, when you study the Old Testament, you're to be theocentric. It's just a tuxedo-wearing word that means God-centered. Well, 
Grace-focused optimism is theological in the sense that it is a God-centered optimism. Now, I want you to see that in our text. And so I want you to look again at Romans 8, 28 through 30. And I'm going to read the text once again. And I'm going to put an emphasis on one pronoun. And if you will pay attention, then I, then I think you'll see that this is an optimism that is theological. Now, listen now. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God to those who are called according to His purpose, for those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to become conformed to the image of His Son, so that He would be the firstborn among many brethren. And those whom He predestined, He also called. And those whom He called, He also justified. And those whom He justified, He also glorified. What is given top billing in grace-focused optimism? God. Grace-focused optimism, brothers and sisters, is optimism about the true and the living God. So when we say we are optimistic, when I say I am optimistic, what I'm trying to communicate is I'm optimistic about the God to whom I belong. And I hope you are too, and I hope your optimism about Him will grow as we study together. So it's theological optimism. Now follow me. That makes it realistic because... Listen now, ultimate reality is what? It is I am. So if I am optimistic about God, if I have reason to be optimistic about God, then I have an optimism that is absolutely genuine and authentic and dependable. I'm never going to find a time where my optimism embarrasses me. Because the God to whom I belong is utterly and absolutely trustworthy. So it's theological. Then it is a doctrinal optimism. If you will look again at verses 28 through 30, I think, as I said, you have here the quintessential declaration of, of grace-focused optimism that you find, I think, in, anywhere in the Bible. Will you notice, please listen now, how densely theological it really is. It, it's nothing but theology. Look at the different words. Each of the words communicates a very profound, very important, very deep theological concept. Take a look again now, just, just follow me. For those whom he foreknew, uh, th that, that, that is a deep theological idea. Them he also, the P word now, I can use it in here, can I not, without fear, predestined. And those whom he predestined, them he also called. And those whom he called, them he also justified. And those whom he justified, them he also glorified. Doctrine, 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 doctrine. Teaching, teaching, teaching. Truth, truth, truth. When I hear Christians, and I sometimes hear Christians say, I'm not interested in doctrine, I want to grab them and shake them and say, then you're not interested in living for Jesus Christ. You simply cannot live for Jesus without doctrine. You know what it is to be foreknown? You need to know. You know what it is to be predestined? You need to know. You know what it is to be called? You need to know. You know what it is to be justified? You need to know. You know what it is to know that you're going to be glorified? You need to know because this is the fuel for the fire of the optimism that you're going to need to handle the life that you are called to live as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I'm, I was about to say, forgive me for getting so excited. I'm not going to say that. I'm going to try to hold down just a little bit, okay? <laughs> I've done these types of things before with these types of things, and I've almost knocked them right into the table in front of me. So <laughs> forgive me, brother. I've got good insurance, okay? <laughs> we we'll take care of you all if that happens. All right. So it, it, it is the, theological. It is doctrinal. And then it is a personal optimism. What I mean by that, uh, quite simply, is this. This optimism is not an optimism that belongs only to some believers. It is an optimism that belongs to every single person who fits the description as one who loves God and who has been called according to His purpose. And about who is that speaking? That is speaking about every true believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you not love God? Do you not love God 
for the single truth that you find in this passage, predestination? Predestination is an activity of the love of God. Listen, there would not be a Christian on the face of this earth if predestination were not a truth. Every single person who comes to Jesus Christ has been predestined to come to Jesus Christ. And if I have come to Jesus Christ, then I have the evidence I have been predestined. Is that not what Luke says at the end of Acts 13? And as many as were ordained unto eternal life believed. You see, that, that's where you get the optimism. If I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, that means God has chosen me before the foundation of the world. If God has chosen me before the foundation of the world, I ought to be the most optimistic person on the face of this earth. We make a grave mistake when we talk about these things hesitantly and apologetically. Don't be hesitant. Don't apologize. They're in the book, and they're the reason you're in the church <laughs> and in the Lord Jesus Christ. So it, it is theological. It is doctrinal. It is personal. If you believe in Jesus, Romans 8, 28 through 30 is talking about you. It's talking about you personally. It is as personal to you as your own DNA. Are you with me there? All right. Then it is practical. And what I mean by it being practical, quite simply, is that you can't live for God without this optimism. A man comes up to D.L. Moody. He says, Mr. Moody, do you think I'm a Christian? And Moody looks at him and says, not a red hot one. <laughs> now, you can be a Christian without this optimism, but you can't be a red hot one. I don't think you can find a Christian in the New Testament who was avid in his or her devotional to the Lord Jesus Christ that was not characterized by this optimism. Think about the Apostle Paul, the greatest Christian who's ever walked the face of this earth. He's the most optimistic man you'll ever run across with one exception. You know who that one exception was? The Lord Jesus Christ. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. What is that? It's optimism. He knew he was coming out of that tomb. It's Friday. He knew Sunday was coming. He lived that sermon before it was preached. Optimism. Optimism is something that ought to characterize us as practical. And when it does, it's going to help us live. If you'll look here, notice why Paul talks about this. Did you catch it? The section begins, if you'll look, I think at verse 17 or 18, I consider that the sufferings of this present time. And then if you look right after the statement is made in verse 40, 35, Paul says, we all as sheep are led to the slaughter. Do, he, this is genuine Christianity. And I think, I hope I'm wrong. My prayer, heart's desire and prayer to God is Habakkuk. Oh, Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years, in the midst of the years, revive it. But I think we're going to be the first generation of believers in America to face systematic state persecution. I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong. But I don't think I am. And brothers and sisters, if we do not find ourselves gripped by grace-focused optimism, if we are not sure that God is up to something glorious and grand in our lives, we are going to fold like the proverbial cheap suit. This is practical stuff. Then two other things. It's doxological. I don't know anything that will give you Wesley's Oh for a Thousand Tongues to Sing, My Great Redeemer's Praise, like this matter of grace focused optimism. When you have this optimism, it enables you to do what Paul and Silas did at midnight, having been scourged and they are locked in chains. And what do they do? They do, brother. You don't hear them murmuring. How can you say you love me and do this to me? They are singing praise to God. Why? Because when you understand what grace means and you understand how committed God really is to you, it's going to make you sing, even if you're a Presbyterian. <laughs> I don't know if I could get by with that one, brother. But... Okay, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Finally, it, it's essential, and I'm just round, rounding back. I, I don't think we can be the people God wants us to be if we don't have this particular optimism. So come back. It's an optimism about God. It's an optimism about a particular truth that we are about to look at. 
It's an optimism that is deeply, deeply personal. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have every reason to be optimistic. It is an optimistic, as you see right there, that is practical. It'll change your life. It will lead you to sing doxologically to God again and again and again. And then you, you will find it helping you over and over and over. So optimism. Everybody, I hope I, hope I explained it. That some idea of what, 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 what I'm talking about. All right, second word here is the word grace. I, I want to be very, very careful here because I'm going to say something, and as I say it, I want you to hear where it's coming from. I'm a pastor. I've been a pastor for 51 years, and I know the people of God are hurting, and I know that when you say something that is a criticism of the people of God, it, it can very easily be misconstrued. And you can very easily become an ally of Satan and an accuser of the brethren. Okay, so I, I'm prefacing what I'm about to say. So I'm saying it with my gentlest bedside manner. Most Christians that I have met have a woefully undeveloped view of what the grace of God in Jesus Christ really is. What I think most of us have done, notice the pronoun us. This, this, when I went through the stuff I went through, the biggest thing God did with me was just grab me and shake me and say, son, you have no idea what grace is like. You have no idea what my grace to you really is. Seminary, RTS. There was a thing called sermon criticism. Now, that's just a euphemism for theological waterboarding. <laughs> I'm just telling you. You would stand and you would preach in chapel to your classmates, 30, 40, 50 people. And when you got through, you had the joy of having your fingernails pulled with the pliers of a professor's criticism. A friend of mine preached his senior sermon. And the professor got up and came to the front and looked at him and said, and I quote, Son, don't you know the meaning of grace? Now, look, we were seminary students. We thought we knew everything. <laughs> we sure thought we knew the meaning of grace. But I don't think we did. And as I've gotten older, I, I find that very few Christians have any significant grasp of what grace, God's grace in Jesus Christ really is. <laughs> Let me give you what I'm talking about. I think if you talk to the average Christian, and you say, tell me what grace is, that man, that woman is going to define grace in one of two ways, perhaps in both ways. Grace means that I am forgiven on the basis of Jesus' death on the cross. And grace means that I'm going to heaven when I die. And I submit to you, brothers and sisters, that these are wonderful facts about grace. There is very, There are very few things in the rest of grace that are greater than forgiveness. When God forgives you, He takes you off death row. When God forgives you, it means you may hear the bark of the hound of hell when it's preached in Scripture, but you're never going to feel its bite. You are forgiven. All the charges against you have been dropped. That's glorious. And to know that when you die, at the split second you die, Jesus says to you what He said to the thief, this moment you will be, today you will be with me in power. Those are glorious things. I'm not denying that. But if my understanding of grace stops there, then I have taken a California redwood and whittled it down to a toothpick. Because the grace of God in Jesus Christ is far higher, far wider, and far deeper than forgiveness and going to heaven when I die. So what is the grace of God? I think the definition of grace that you find in Romans 8, 28 through 30 is the one that we are to be acting upon. So let's break it down. Humpty Dumpty, that very well-known theologian, no, Humpty Dumpty, the Reverend Dr. Humpty Dumpty, says to Alice in Through the Looking Glass, when I use a word, it means whatever I want it to mean. <laughs> When God uses a word, it means whatever God wants it to mean. So what is the grace of God? Will you look 
And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are the called according to his purpose. Follow me now. God's grace in Jesus Christ is God's irrevocable commitment to make you the kind of person who will ultimately be perfectly happy and perfectly holy. It is not simply that he forgives you. It is not simply that he's taking you to heaven. He is frying far, far bigger fish. What he is doing is this. He is seeking to make you more and more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to notice now, I think this is, this is what trips all of us up on this, these two verses because we, we read God works all things together for good and immediately, in spite of our protestations, every single one of us is a health and wealth gospeler. I'm just telling you we are. I know my heart. I think I probably know your heart because I know my heart. I follow the old Scottish method of preaching. Preach against your own sins, you're going to get everybody else listening to you. The moment something happens and we say, I don't see how this can be working for my good. What have we said? My good is my prosperity. My good is my health. My, my good is my convenience. My good is my pleasure. You're taking those things away. How can you say you are working for my good? Now, please, if you get nothing else, get this. Verse 29, please look at it is what theologians call exegetical. That's just a big fancy word that simply means this. Verse 29 explains verse 28. You remember when the Ethiopian eunuch is reading Isaiah 48, uh, 58, 3, he's in his chariot, and, and Philip comes up and he says, what are you reading? And he says, I'm reading Isaiah 53. And Philip says, do you understand? And he says, I, I can't understand unless someone explains it to me. And Philip gets into the chariot and he explains it. Okay. Isaiah, uh, excuse me, Romans 8, 28 is the Ethiopian in the chariot. <laughs> and verse 29 is Philip getting up there and explaining it. So here, follow me now. This is how it would be rightly translated. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined, listen, to become conformed to the image of his son. When God says he's working all things to our good, my brother and my sister, what God is saying is this. I am causing, follow me, every single thing that I allow to come into your life to shape and mold you into the likeness and image of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's good. That's good. Amen. That's good. Now, why is that good? Why is being like the Lord Jesus Christ the best thing that God can do for us? What, what Paul's telling us right here is that by good uh, grace, what God is doing is he's giving us the very best that he can give us. Why is that so? Into what a state did the fall bring mankind? The fall brought mankind into an estate of sin and misery. All human misery has as its source human sin. And until the sin is dealt with, the misery is going to remain. So that for God to come and say, I'm making you like Jesus Christ, is for God to come and say, I'm dealing with the sin in your life. I'm going to deal with the totality of the sin in your life. And the day is going to come when I remove that sin completely and you are perfectly and permanently like Jesus and being perfectly and permanently like Jesus, you're going to be perfectly and permanently happy. And isn't that what Revelation says? What does God do when Jesus returns and we are made completely like him? Isn't that what John says? We shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. And how is that described? And he shall wipe away all tears. So the grace of God is God's commitment, God's activity, God's work to make you more and more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are told here that he is always up to that, that there is nothing that happens to you, nothing that comes, whether it's good or something very undesirable, at which you cannot look and say with Joseph, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Now, do you believe that? 
then why do you complain? <laughs> Follow me now. See, I, we don't believe this, brothers and sisters. We don't believe how rich the grace of God in Jesus Christ really is. So let me break it down. I, I don't have much time, but I, I want you to look. Just look again at the terms. For those whom he foreknew, will you listen? What that means is this. Before he ever made you, God settled upon you his saving love. He didn't have to. He did it because he wanted to. When I was a kid, you'd fall in love with a girl. You know, eighth grade, I probably fell in love with 50 girls in the eighth grade. And what'd you do? We carried pocket knives. They weren't lethal weapons back then. Mumbly, y'all don't even know what I'm talking about. Anyway, and you'd get to a tree and you'd carve a heart in that tree and you'd put Charlie Chase plus Sue West. I ain't a dummy. That's my wife's maiden name. For no means that in the tree of eternity past, God put his name and your name and said, I'm going to love you with saving love. Now, do you believe that? If you believe he has always loved you, all right, predestination. What is predestination? Predestination is quite simply this. God has brought you to this earth for one purpose, to get glory from you by making you like Jesus Christ. If you want to know the why of your existence, there it is. It's just what he says right here. He is going to exalt Jesus, making him the firstborn among many brethren. How? By making you like him. Think of the glory of that. So that everything that comes, everything that comes, is being used by your heavenly Father to make you more like Jesus Christ. Those whom he foreknew, then he also predestined. Those whom he predestined, then he also called. I, I won't go any further. Let me just stop with that. What does that mean? It means he brought Jesus to you. How did the good news get thrown into your driveway? <laughs> because God sent someone to tell you the good news. He brings Jesus to you. He brings you to Jesus. That's where repentance and faith are. By grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. My very trust in Jesus is due to God and it is evidence that God foreknew me and that God predestined me and that God is moment by moment in everything that happens making me more and more like Jesus. When y'all get to heaven you all go say amen. You are. Your foot's going to tap like a charismatic. I'm just telling you. I'm just, I'm just getting you ready when you get there. Because brothers and sisters, we ought to glory in this. I'm just going to say to you, Calvinistic, I, I don't like the word, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to use, Calvinistic Christians ought to be the happiest, most joyful, most contented, most grateful people on the face of the earth. And our worship ought to rock. I don't mean by that it ought to be crazy. But when people come in, they ought to sense, man, these people are here for a reason and something's going on. They are glad to be here. Why? They understand grace. <laughs> if my God is that committed to me. So I'll give you one final verse. I'm cutting out a lot of stuff. Uh, one final verse that I want to ask you just to write down. It's from Jeremiah 32. You're very familiar with it. When God says, I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Now listen to the language. That I will not turn away from them to do them good. And I will put the fear of me in their hearts so that they will not turn away from me. I will rejoice over them to do them good and will faithfully plant them in this land with all my heart and with all my soul. Now, God delights in making you like Jesus. There is a psychological idea called flow. You ever heard of it? It, it was discovered by one of these Eastern Bloc psychologist whose his name's is all consonants. And he said, well, how do you pronounce that? Smith. <laughs> all right. You know, CZ, but whatever. Flow is when you're doing something, you understand flow, you understand flow, you're both preachers. When you're doing something, you, you, it's, you're so joyful that you don't want it to stop. That, that you're, man, you, you just a leap on a stream and you don't, you don't want to, you don't want to be fished out of the stream. God experiences flow in giving you his grace, in making you like 
the Lord Jesus Christ. The grace of God is far more than forgiveness. The grace of God is far more than us going to heaven. The grace of God is God taking literally everything that happens to us and using it to make us more like Jesus Christ because the more like Jesus we become now, the more joy and peace and power and contentment we're going to know. And then ultimately when we're perfectly like him, we're going to be perfectly happy. Will you look at me? I'm 77 years old. I know I look <laughs> 10 years older than that, but that's another story. And I'm breaking down. My knees, man, they're gone. But the day is going to come when I'm exactly like Jesus Christ. Exactly. Mentally, spiritually, psychologically, physically, even my body is going to be transformed into his glorious body. Now, if that's true, then can you not let goods and kindred go this mortal life also? If this is grace, if God is this committed to me, can I not be optimistic that ultimately everything's going to be okay? I'm going to stop. I'm not going to go into the focus. I want to leave you with one thing. A little boy loves Westerns. He's about 12 years old. It's 9 o'clock and his parents say, it's time to go to bed. So he goes up, he gets in bed. No reading. Go up there and turn the light out. He goes up, gets in bed. About an hour later, his parents come up and they hear laughter in his bedroom. So the dad walks over and he opens the door. And the boy's under the blanket with a flashlight reading a Western. And all the while he's saying, if you only knew what I know. If you only knew what I know. And the dad says, Johnny, what? What's going on? You weren't supposed to be reading. Oh, Dad, I know. He said, I got up here and I started reading my Western and I was in the middle of it and the hero, I just didn't think he was going to make it. I, I thought he was a goner. So, Dad, I turned to the end of the book <laughs> and I read what happened to him and he won. He beat all the bad guys. And so I came back to the middle and I'm saying to the bad guys, if you only knew what I know. <laughs> if you only knew what I know. You know more now of what the grace of God in Jesus Christ is. It is his commitment not to let you go until he has made you exactly like Jesus and being exactly like Jesus, perfectly and permanently happy. So come back. God wants you to live as a grace-focused optimist by believing that Romans 8, 28 through 30, believing that, that that is talking about you. Let's pray. Oh, Father, uh, help us. This is, it's almost too su stupendous uh, yeah, to, to think that from all eternity you set your love on us and that you brought us into this world as vessels of mercy. And that even before you brought us to Christ, even then you were watching over us and you were keeping us so that we didn't die in our sin or send the sin unto death. When so many around us perish, we did not perish. Why? Because of your purpose for us. You're going to make us like Jesus. And, and that's, that's more important than anything else. And it's what you are up to all the time. And you delight, you delight in being gracious to us. I pray that you'll use this truth, the truths that we study tonight, to encourage each of my brothers and each of my sisters and to encourage me that I'm to live as a grace-focused optimist, believing that Romans 8, 28 through 30 is talking about me. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.